should I rise or should I fall? Even so, Lord, your mercy is an even flow. Good morning and welcome to Whispering Hope uh, lesson study for today. We are uh, brand a brand new week and uh, a brand new, brand new discourse for the week. Jesus, the faithful priest. And this morning we're looking at the topic, a priest on behalf of human beings. That's our topic for this morning. And we have no stranger to the set here on with great hope, Elder Maurice Stewart and Alton Jarvis. Uh, elders, good morning. Welcome. Uh, why don't you just greet the brethren? Well, good morning to everyone. I pray that God has blessed us as he has opened our eyes today. And we will learn from at his feet what he desires for us to know. Amen. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. I, I thank the Lord for waking us up in our right minds. Having blessed us through the night with rest and protection. And as he brought us awake, may we look to him for leadership as we go forward. And when he shall come, may he find us all faithful and save us for his kingdom. Amen. Amen. I can tell Elder, Elder Cyril, you, you would have had a good night. I mean, this is the strongest, <laughs> this is the strongest your voice has ever been here. You know, and it's so early in the morning. Right? So, um, <laughs> God is good. God that's, is good. That's, that's all the time. That's just a light moment here. And so, Elder Cyril, I'm going to ask you to read our memory text this morning. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. And Elder Jarvis, you will pray for us before we go into our study. Let us pray, <laughs> loving Father. We thank you so much for your goodness towards us. We thank you for your great mercies and for your love for your watch, care, and your protection. We pray, dear God, that you will be with us today. We ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to come divinely close to us and bless us. May our minds be massaged so that we may receive the message from heaven, that we may be challenged, transformed, and even changed. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And the Bible says... Hebrews 7, verse 26, in the New King James Version. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Amen. 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 Elder, Elder Javis, if you could turn to Hebrews chapter 5 and read verses 1 to 10 for us. We're moving straight into the scripture this morning. All right, the, the Bible reads, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, thou art high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, 
he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Okay. Elder Kieran, based on the, the scripture text just now, what was the purpose of the priesthood? What was the purpose of the priesthood? The priesthood was <laughs> assumed by Jesus. The passage so it, it provided a clear analysis of Jesus' uh, priesthood and, and to emphasize Jesus' authority and his purpose and his mission as he came from his father. The whole purpose, as I understand it, was to stress the point, if you will, of Jesus as a high priest, as our high priest. And the, and the job is the physical priesthood, they needed to be merciful and understanding of, of human weakness. Let's, let's liken that unto, unto Jesus, our high priest. Well, the, the, the thing is, the priests were called and set aside for special work of offering sacrifices and gifts unto God. They were to be the go-between, the ones who stand before God and also stand before the people. Now, they needed to be merciful. And the reason being, if we think about when we go to God in prayer, what do we say? We ask, we're asking for forgiveness. We're asking for mercy. We're asking for God's long suffering. We know our frailties and our weaknesses. And we are petitioning God to extend his graces to us as individuals. However, the, the, the human nature is of such that we cry mercy for ourselves, but generally we suggests that everyone else needs judgment and justice. The issue that the priest, the priesthood, they need to be in needed to be in touch with their own frailties, their own humanity, their own natures. And in doing so, they would be more sympathetic, empathetic with the plight of their fellow human beings, knowing that they too need a savior as priests so they could gracefully and gladly represent all those who have issues before the Heavenly Father, putting their confession, their sacrifice before him so that he can forgive them of their sins because they as priests also need such forgiveness. And the truth, the, the Levitical uh, people, they, they mediate between sinners and God. What, what was that pointing to, if it was pointing to anything at all? <laughs> of course it was. It, it was intended to be that, that connection, that glue, if you will, between God and his people. You know, whereas prior to Jesus' uh, birth, that was the mechanism or the connection, if you will, that, that brought God's people to himself. It was through that conduit, as you use the term. But since at Jesus' birth, God sent him here for a purpose to assume that role. Unfortunately, folks from whom he came didn't see him or didn't understand his role and purpose. But that purpose was to bring God, bring God's people closer to him. Okay. Elder Jaffa, how does all of this, how does Jesus fulfill these, these purposes? We look at the 
the physical feet towards uh, the the stand between um, sinful human beings and God. I mean, they were appointed by God in order to minister on behalf of, of human beings. And uh, we, we just said that they needed to be merciful and understand human weakness. What is this telling us about God and Jesus, Jesus himself? Well, the, the, the issue of sin and us being redeemed from our condition is that it needed one who was like us, but one who was also like God. Because the sacrifice that was needed could not have been made by any one of us. We would, even if all humanity from the beginning to the end would die to pay the penalty for sin, it would not have been sufficient. So the one whom, and, and I want for us to, re, to think about Jesus' role, because he not only assumed the position of priest, but while he was priest, he was also the sacrifice. And he was also the perfect sacrifice, unblemished, and was presented before the Father as being sufficient to pay the price for fallen humanity. Jesus came and he says, the Bible says that uh, he was touched, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was tempted in like manner mm -hmm. as we are yet without sin. And he was affected by the frailties of humanity. He knows what it is that we are going through. So he is uniquely connected to us in the walk that we face on this earth. And he knows our frailties. He knows our issues. And because he overcame, he's saying, you can lean on me and I will give you the power to overcome as well. I will cover you with all of your stuff. As long as you yield to me, I will present you as faultless before my father. So he is fully aware, fully involved. And the various roles that Jesus plays signifies that he has taken upon himself the responsibility to fully redeem man from the clutches of the enemy. And the, the, the Levitical priests, they were chosen from among men. Correct. Jesus was not chosen from among men. Yes. The Levitical priesthood, they have to offer up prayers for their own sins as well. Jesus knew no sin. Jesus did not have to offer up any prayers on behalf of his own sin. What is it saying to us about the priesthood of Jesus as opposed to the Levitical priest? The difference here is perfection. Jesus' priesthood was flawless. It was without blemish. It was perfect. There was no dilution. However, as you mentioned, the Levitical priesthood, though they were chosen, they were human beings, subjected to faults, subjected to sin, unlike Jesus. And so hence, to provide a much better opportunity for salvation, God had to send his perfect son to do what no human being priests or otherwise, could have done for his people. Okay. Elder, Elder Jarvis, in, 
in Hebrew from the passage that you read, it said that Jesus prayed and, and, and he said to him who was able to say to save him from death. And he was heard. What death are we referring to here? Well, we know that he did sleep in the tomb for three days. So it wasn't the this initial cessation of life. But the death generally what is referred to by scripture is the eternal death, the eternal separation, the one in which when the time of the end is come and judgment is declared, there's some who will be separated from God permanently. Uh, this, this is the death that he suggested. Everything else is considered a sleep because we will be awakened at some point in time for God's finality. But Jesus was spared the eternal death. His father called him three days. His body didn't even see corruption. His father called him and he awoke and his life was given him and he was triumphant over hell, death, and the grave. So he, this is the second death that he will not see because he's alive forevermore. Amen. So, El 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 Eturus, Jesus prayed and he was saved from this, this death, the second death, as Elder Jarvis right, rightfully said. Um, what hope, what hope this gives us today? Okay. Jesus being saved from that second death. Jesus' main purpose to us was to save us. And as he came and surrendered his life, his purpose established the, the pathway by which we could be saved. Hence, there was no second death for Jesus because his purpose had been accomplished, totally and completely accomplished in the first death. When he arose on that first day of the week, you know, he declared that his purpose has been accomplished. There's another point I want to make here. At his ascension, he declared to his disciples that, if I may paraphrase, that they have nothing to fear. Because as he leaves them, he would send the perfect replacement, the Holy Spirit. So they had nothing to fear. So there's no, there was no second death for Jesus. He had accomplished his purpose at the first death. Hello, Johnny. Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. How is this? <laughs> I imagine that the author was a little bit liberal in his expression because Jesus really, his obedience wasn't, wasn't subject to his suffering. Uh, he was obedient because he was obedient. He had a relationship with the father and he functioned based on that relationship because of the power in which it provided the connection with his father imbued him with strength and he continued to walk uprightly um, in obedience. Now, we have to bear in mind that he's one who was accustomed to being obeyed. And because he is God, it's not necessary for him to be obedient to anyone. He is supreme. So to look at what he did, he condescended. And in doing so, he relied upon his relationship with his father to sustain him, to strengthen him, to carry him through his walk. And by that, he was able to walk in obedience. Um, he suffered greatly, but it 
the, it's the, the suffering was not the catalyst for his obedience. He, he did suffer because he had taken on the frailty of man. He walked the road of those who are sinful. He suffered all of their ills and he was tempted in like manner as they are. And he is yet without sin because he leaned towards the power that sustained him. So yes, he did suffer, but his obedience was not a consequence of his suffering. Well, at least in my estimation. Elder, Elder Steven, let me just bring you in here, here a bit because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking of this Jesus being obedient to his suffering. This is, this is uh, Jesus was God. I mean, everyone obeyed him. Everyone mm -hmm. obeyed him. I, I'm just here thinking about the sacrifice the sacrifice that Jesus really, really made, the way he suffered, you know, having everyone obeying him. And now, I mean, can we elaborate a, a bit on that, Elder Tyrell? The significant point here is that Jesus was sinless. He had no sin as opposed to fallen human beings. And so his purpose of coming to earth was to correct the wrong, was to right the wrong that the devil had implanted in human beings. And at, at his death, he accomplished that, despite the fact that Satan had his own motives, Jesus overcame all of those. At his death, he was sinless, and guess what? He was tempted, just like any one of us, but yet he never yielded to sin, and that's a significant difference. And the devil, let me ask you this question: Jesus is suffering and death on the cross. Uh, essential, they are essential part of his priestly ministry. Let's look at the Levitical ministry. I mean, the, the Levitical priesthood, they didn't have to, to suffer as Jesus did in his priestly ministry. What a big contract. Why? I think it is evident in the differences of the role. Jesus was unique in every way. And if we look at, he, he is the embodiment of everything that was functional in the earthly sanctuary, the, the, the type. Because he, the, the lava bowl, he was he represented. He represented the altar of sacrifice. He 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 represented the seven golden candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. He represented the the article in the most holy. He, he represents the sacrifice. Everything pointed to him. That's correct. And also, he functioned as priests. Now, we know that since 1844, this is what he's been doing primarily in heaven, interceding on behalf of humanity. His high priestly role is in full display at this particular time. Now, he not only is our high priest, but he's also our sacrifice, the one who spilled their blood and died so that this blood could be presented to cover and remove our sin. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, 
there is no remission for sin. So we here understand that even though the Levitical priesthood was a type, it was not a perfect type because they too needed to do those things that they were ministering on behalf of others. They too needed to bring a lamb. They too needed to bring a bullock, a dog. They too needed to do these things and have someone else present these offerings before God on their behalf at some other point in time. So whereas they were fulfilling a function in this office on these circumstances, someone else needed to fulfill that office for them at some other point in time. So it was not a perf it's not a perfect reflection. That is the difference between the Levitical priesthood and Jesus' priesthood. Jesus, no one presents Jesus to the Father for him, for, for him. He is there doing it for every one of us. And the reason why there's no one who's worthy to present Jesus to the Father is because Jesus was perfect. He was not of fallen humanity. He didn't fall. We are fallen humanity. We need a representation. And that's the reason why Jesus is our perfect representative. The perfect, the perfect scripture I've seen here embodies what Elijah just said. It's Hebrews 4.15. And it says... For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yes, yet without sin. Without sin. Man. It's, all, it's all encompassing. Yes, it is. Second Peter 2 9 says that we are a royal priesthood. What does Jesus' life tell us about our relationship with our human being should be because we are, we are a royal priesthood? Okay. Royal priesthood, though we may be, we are all sinners. None of us in the sight of God is better than anyone else. We, we must see ourselves as equals. Yes, we have different gifts, different talents, but none of us is better than the other. We are all sinners. And that is the, that is the key here. A royal piece of nature comes from and is developed by our loyalty to God. And so as long as we are willing to surrender, surrender self, and let God take charge. Yes, we will be considered included in that royalty. However, we need not think of ourselves better than or worse than any other person. God sees us as sinners saved by his grace. And that's how we are, we are to relate to all our fellow men. Because we too need a savior. You couldn't share with us your takeaway from this morning study and Elder material will follow up with his takeaway from the study this morning. Elder John. Well, really, Jude, I am really amazed that when we look at Jesus and his various roles, he is one who is carrying the load for the redemption of man. We know that he is God. We know that he is Michael. We know that he is the captain of the heavenly host. We know that he is the chief prince. But he also came to earth to take on more titles. He is now the first Adam. Because our Adam fell. So he came to reclaim the authority that was given to the first Adam. Mm -hmm. So he is now Adam in every spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. 
because the, the Bible says that first it comes in the natural and then it comes, it is spiritual. That's what Paul says in, in the Corinthians. Now, Jesus also functioned and is functioning as our high priest. But not only our high priest, but he's also our sacrifice. He is the perfect sacrifice. So my, what I am seeing is the awesome magnitude of the weight of man's redemption are born on the shoulders of Christ. And he is happily doing these things because of his great love towards us. Uh, he is just this great God and all we need to do when we consider everything that he is doing and he has done is to just surrender and say, Lord, I will. And I pray that God will strengthen me so that I can be that person to say, Lord, I will just follow you. Amen, amen. Yeah. Brethren, my takeaway is embodied in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, which says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be, be touched, with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he didn't sin. That is the standard. There's no standard higher than that. And each of us, as we live our lives, we should look at that example. Yes, we are sinful, but Jesus died to provide the way for us to get out of our sinful nature. We must admit, like David, that we have committed sin, ask God to blot, blot them out and to bless us, and he will. So I look at that as the opportunity we have as sinners to, to rely upon Jesus who died for us. And as we surrender our lives, salvation will be ours. Amen. Uh, we want to thank Elder Jarvis and Elder Twill for stopping by this morning to go through our lesson study this morning, a priest on behalf of human beings. We better remember that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus came, he suffered, and paid the ultimate sacrifice. And so as we go out today, I just want us to be reminded that COVID is still around. Let us maintain our social distance. Let us continue to wear our mask correctly and to sanitize. May God be with us until we meet right here again tomorrow, where the study will be according to the order of Melchizedek. Have a blessed day, everyone.